Hi, everyone. Okay. How far away from this do I need to be? Um, so today I'm going to go over the new volume builder generator uh, for those of you who use Cinema 4D. Um, so a little overview. This is a new feature in the R20 release that, in my opinion, is pretty much a game changer when it comes to modeling. Um, however, I've found it to be really useful as well for creating kind of complex MOA animations. So it kind of allows you to build complex models based on a voxel-based sculpting method. Uh, so what is a voxel? The answer is, I don't really know. <laughs> I just think of it as a 3D pixel. Um, and then besides that, I'm a little in the dark about it. Uh, so I think the easiest way is for me to just kind of show you um, some examples of ways I've applied it to animations uh, lately since the release came out. So the first example I'm gonna show is molecular modeling, and this has been the most useful for me. Uh, for this demo, I just chose an antibody. I think it's the most recognizable molecule probably out there. So to begin with, um, I go to the PDB and locate the entry that I wanna source um, the data from. Then I go into C40, sorry, it's very small on my laptop. Um, and I'm going to use EPMB, which is an open source software that was created by Graham Johnson. I'm gonna pause this. I recorded this ahead of time so I wouldn't mess up. Um, and uh, so yeah, I wanna pause this and say that basically it just allows you to bring in data from the protein data bank directly into C4D so you don't have to use an external application. Um, so. Let's play this. I just enter the PDB entry information and it will pull that antibody model for me. So I wanna select the point clouds option and this gives you a point for every single atom in your molecule. And you can also see that it separates the chains, which is really nice if you, for instance, wanted to pull in like a complex receptor with a bunch of different chains. Um, so I'm gonna delete that step out and it also puts these points into an atom array object, which will give you a sphere for every single point. Now I'm just arranging my model. So the atom array is what my volume measure is going, or volume builder is going to use as a source. So I need to increase the subdivisions of the spheres and make them a little larger. Then I'm going to go up to the volume builder and I'll just drag one of my chains or atom arrays into the object box. So now you can see the voxels and it just looks like a really pixelated image basically. So when I drop that down, then you start to see the form taking shape. Now I'll drop this into the volume mesher, which is going to generate my mesh and it doesn't look so good. But if I tweak a few settings, you can see it start to take shape. And all of this was, you were able to do it in EPMB, but you were never able to do something like this in Cinema 4D before, unless you're using Metaballs, which are kind of a nightmare. So this is like the new and improved Metaball, I would say. Um, so you can change the threshold, switch it to, a different shading so you can see everything. Um, and then you can add a smooth layer, which will kind of go in and refine those, like some of those rough edges that you can see. And you just have to adjust the voxel distance, um, adjust the strength. There are different filter types, you know, just play around with it and see you get what you want. All right, so for the interest of time, I went ahead and did all of them and then applied materials to it. Um, so this I'm just showing that you can also manipulate the mesh by changing the scale of your atom array. You can you know, have finer detail or you can make it larger to kind of have a bigger surface model. Um, so that's that with that antibody. Another way I've 
use this in probably the most useful way is creating bone matrix. If anyone has ever tried to create a complicated bone matrix by hand, it takes forever and it's a huge pain. Um, so this new feature really takes the legwork out of it. I'll just run through a quick tutorial. Um, start off just with a simple cube and make it a thousand by a thousand is what I chose. So the bigger your objects, obviously the larger your voxels can be. Um, I'm gonna crank up the subdivisions on that to a lot. And stick it in the volume builder. So apply the volume mesher and you can see your mesh generated. So for this, I am going to, to basically make my bone matrix using a shader field. And fields is another thing that was introduced in R20, which is also amazing, but I can't get into that right now. I don't have time. Uh, but you can use the shader field to model with procedural textures, which is just awesome. Um, so I'm just gonna load a noise and nothing is happening yet, but I'll get to that. Um, kind of increase the clipping. All right, so in my shader field, I need to increase the box size to my actual cube size. And now you kind of start to see it um, taking shape. So there you go. And I'm still going to refine this. Um, oh, it's right here in front of me. I don't have to be looking at that. <laughs> um, OK, so I'm still going to refine this, decrease the voxel size a bit um, to kind of get what I want. I'll change the noise up to be something a little more organic. And if anyone has ever used the plugin procedural, this is, in my idea, kind of this, along the same lines, but it's so much faster and it's just something that C40 never had before. You know, it's like creating this model would have taken probably weeks, in my opinion. Um, so adjusting the clipping will, you know, give some contrast in the procedural and that'll make the kind of chewed out sections a little more obvious. All right, so this is looking pretty good. Um, I can go in and add a smooth layer, which I need to drag to the top of the hierarchy. And that is too crazy, so I'm going to go in and adjust the filter type. Voxel size, and I think this is where I, I think this is the sweet spot where I ended. Yep. Um, I'll just give this a quick render and let you see the final product. So yeah, that was um, creating a cube of bone matrix with a shader. All right, now I'll go into kind of more of the animation side of it and do a look, just a quick demo on cell apoptosis, which is something that, again, we have to do a lot of in MOA animations, but it's just, other than metaballs, kind of difficult to do um, in the native C4D features. So I'm gonna start out with a basic sphere, change it to an icosahedron, and crank up the segments again. And then I'm gonna duplicate this, and this is what, my little interior spheres that kind of blub out. Oh, my computer's always full, okay. Um, <laughs> I, so I'm gonna clone a sphere to this smaller interior sphere. All right, 
point space still just adjusting some settings and crank that up um, for a cloner if you're going to use it in the volume builder it does need to be an instance it can't be a render instance um, it needs to source the actual geometry which can bog down the scene which you will see later um, So now basically I'm just kind of adding some deformers. I added a displacer with a noise that's going to kind of give the surface some undulations as it starts to die, basically. Um, crank up the segments. All right, so now I'm gonna animate this do some keyframes to animate that noise on. All right, so I'll hide that for the time being, because now I want to focus on the interior spheres. So I'm going to add a random effector, which I will change to the noise setting so that it um, is animated, basically. Crank up the position. Now those are moving. So I'm also going to add a shader, which will, or I'll just show you, um, I need to set this in the UV space so that it doesn't pop on and off when I'm animating the noise. Um, so this is what I'm going to help, this is what's going to make the spears basically disappear over time. So I can animate the clipping and set a couple of keyframes. And now you can see that they kind of just start popping off. I need to offset this so that they gradually fade. So this is going to be basically the base for my apoptosing. I don't know if that's a word, um, cell. So now I'm just going to stick these in one volume builder. Adjust my voxel size. Um, and I want them to be on the union mode because I want them to all basically mesh into one object. So when I put this in the mesher and scrub, it's going to play pretty slow because it's kind of dense. You can see that the little spheres are intersecting, but they're all meshed into one object. All right, so the next thing I want to do is uh, keyframe the radius of the main sphere to disappear over time. So now you see this is pretty typical of how I would normally animate a cell dying. But we can add another little, I guess, piece of complexity to this by using, I'm going to just duplicate my cloner, make it a little bit different and then put it on the subtract mode. So you can see now that this cloner is subtracting out of the other surface. So it's basically becoming a negative influence. So as I animate that, it kind of eats out part of the surface. I just highlighted that with my cursor and other things. Um, so if I add a smooth layer, adjust these settings, that kind of puts it, I'm just gonna scrub through this. That kind of gives it like the last organic touch, I think, to make it look, you know, nice and gooey, as I imagine cells being. Um, all right. Oh, and stop my screen recording. Okay, so, nope. The next, the last thing I'm gonna touch on, and this is probably the thing I'm the most excited about, is creating a dendritic cell. Um, we do a lot of 
immunology animations, and this is a dendritic cell is just something we've never been able to like naturally create. Uh, without some kind of like X particle skinner or something like that. So now that we can do it in C4D, it's, it's really awesome. I've used it for like two or three projects since R20 came out. Um, and it's a really simple setup. So I'm just gonna kind of break down my file here. So I start out with a sphere. I'll turn that to X-ray mode. And then I have another sphere inside that I'm gonna use to generate the hair. So the hair is what my little, I'll call them the little dendrites are. Um, and they're linked to my sphere. And then, so I'm gonna do them. Um, the hair is coming from the polygon center. And then you see as I move the sphere, it has a vibrate tag on it. it the hairs react to it, which makes it just natural looking. So I'm gonna generate a circle, which is gonna be sweeped along the hair, swept along the hair, um, but you see it's not reacting anymore with the movement and the hairs are kind of static. This is a priorities issue. So if you go into the basic and change that, lower the priority, they go crazy and then they start to react again. So if anyone ever has that problem with hair, it's probably your priority. Um, so I can, I can adjust the, the sweep of that circle inside of the hair material, um, adjust my thickness, taper it at the end, and then I can adjust the length and add a noise. And if I animate this noise, it'll start to kind of grow the tendrils in and out um, in kind of a fun organic way. All right, so I'm doing a little more tweaking and um, I also add a displacer onto the cell surface and also animate this noise and that you know gives it that surface undulation. And you can also see this is pretty dense because um, that's what my vo voxel is going to use as its information so I need the mesh to be you know somewhat dense so we get a good end result with the mesh. Um, I also add clone a few spheres to the body of the cell. Um, this just adds another layer of complexity. Add a random effector to those and that'll kind of that affects the position and the scale of them. And then animate that noise as well. I'm just crank that up so you can see. So the last thing I do is add a um, turbulence effector, and this affects the hair, and it gives it kind of a more wavy, you know, undulating motion. So this is the base of my macrophage, and originally in C40, this is where I'd stop and just adjust the material so you couldn't see the seams. But now you can drag this entire thing into a volume builder and adjust the voxel size. And when you throw this into the mesher, it's one smooth object. So again, I'm just gonna tweak a few settings. I don't, I'm probably running low on time, so I don't know if it's worth <laughs> showing all of this, but um, I'll add a smooth layer and then, you know, the end result is basically something I would have never been able to achieve, you know, before this new feature came out. So that's pretty awesome. Um, that's not the final result, but I'll just skip to the end. <laughs> um, so yeah, that pretty much concludes it. And uh, yeah, no questions. <laughs> if anyone has any questions afterwards, feel free to talk to me. I love talking about this new feature, obviously. <laughs>